earnings call and the absolute collapse of their stock. I'm not going to beat around the bush here. If you're a Teladoc shareholder, I'll explain everything that caused the stock to crash so hard. It crashed for good reasons. If you're wondering if you should buy this massive dip, there are a lot of red flags here and I'll show you those too. Either way, your time is valuable, so let's get right into it. Teladoc lost almost 50% of its value this week. If you're a shareholder and you're upset about that, guess what? You have every right to be, and I'm right there with you. If you stick around till the end of the episode, I'll show you just how much money I lost on this trade. But first, let's talk about all the things that caused Teladoc to crash this week, starting with the ultra-rich price tag that they paid for Livongo. Back in 2020, Teladoc purchased Livongo for $18.5 billion. Here's what Kathy Wood had to say about that acquisition right when it happened. So with Livongo, uh, Teladoc now has one of the best artificial intelligence teams and some of the best data. That's the other thing we'll come back to. Most data, best quality data. And uh, we think the combination of Teladoc and Livongo is, is going to be a powerhouse. <laughs> So the idea here is to combine forces to cover the entire spectrum of healthcare, including acute illnesses like the flu, chronic illnesses like diabetes, and mental health services, and much more. People who think Teladoc is just Zoom for doctors are really missing the big picture here. The promise behind Teladoc's acquisition of Livongo is that they'll build out that end-to-end -end ecosystem and dominate the quickly growing telehealth market as a result. So shareholders overwhelmingly approved this $18.5 billion Livongo acquisition, and Teladoc made it happen in just under three months. Looking back, that short timeline might have been a big red flag. Well, this past earnings call, Teladoc posted a loss of $41.58 per share. $41.11 of that came from a goodwill impairment charge of $6.5 billion on this acquisition. Here's what that means at a high level. After Teladoc and Livongo combined in 2020, they were worth $37 billion together. Today, they're worth just over $5 billion. Here's the problem. How can Teladoc and Livongo be worth $5 billion together if Teladoc just paid $18 billion to buy Livongo? Something doesn't add up. The answer is that Teladoc way overpaid for Livongo, and this goodwill impairment charge is how they put the new value of Livongo on their books. Basically, goodwill is how much you're willing to overpay to acquire something. Let's go through an easy example. A car you really want goes on the market for 10 grand. You offer 15 grand to make sure that it's yours, so five of that 15 grand is goodwill. Now let's say the Kelly Blue Book value for that car is 12 grand, but not 15. No problem, because you did your books knowing that it was worth as low as 10, but you were willing to pay as much as 15. Now let's say it's worth just two grand because the car runs way worse than you thought. You just booked an eight grand impairment, the 10 grand minimum you thought it was worth down to two. That's essentially what happened with Teladoc. They just admitted that they paid way too much for Livongo based on how much money they now expected to make because Livongo is bringing in fewer chronic care patients than expected. So Teladoc just booked a goodwill impairment on it for $6.5 billion, which works out to be a little over $41 per share. It's important to understand that this isn't money they actually lost today. It's the accounting of them overpaying for Livongo being recorded on their books. By the way, Teladoc still has almost $8 billion of goodwill on their balance sheet, which is more than their entire market cap today. Here's the thing, Teladoc paid for Livongo almost entirely in stock, not cash. I'll spare you the boring math, but basically I wanted to figure out how much Teladoc's management overpaid for Livongo. How bad they messed up on this acquisition determines how much I should trust them going forward, right? So I looked at the size of the goodwill impairment and the value of their stock today. So basically, after all the goodwill impairments, it appears that Livongo's fair value is just 14% of what Teladoc paid for it. Incredible. But Teladoc didn't actually overpay by 614% because their stock went down a lot as well. So what I did was I ran three scenarios at different values for the deal to see how bad they overpaid in each case. For example, if they made the same deal today, including the 1133 in cash that they paid per share, they would have overpaid for Livongo by 75%. That's almost as much as I overpaid for their stock. But if they made the same deal today, where they paid for Livongo with 94% stock and 6% cash, now they overpaid by only 39%. That still sounds high, but remember, Elon Musk just overpaid for Twitter by around that same amount. 
so at least it's within reason for a big acquisition. Long story short, two years ago, Teladoc overpaid for Lavongo by what I think is between 40 and 75%, and now their books reflect that. This would be almost forgivable if the rest of Teladoc's earnings call wasn't such a hot mess. Let's look at their guidance updates and work backwards. Last quarter, they guided for 25 to 30% revenue growth year over year. Now they're saying it'll be 18 to 23%. That's a huge revision down for a company that should be growing exponentially for years to come. They're also expecting less total visits for the year than they said a quarter ago. At the same time, they've actually increased their marketing spend by a whopping 50%, which means they're spending way more on customer acquisition and acquiring less customers overall. If you've been watching this channel for a while, I always point out the marketing spend when I look at balance sheets. That's the early warning sign for how healthy a company is growing. This is a huge shift in marketing spend in a single quarter, and I think it's a big part of why their stock price fell off a cliff. And with so many growth stocks taking a nosedive like Teladoc, it's important to diversify into assets that can generate solid returns but don't correlate with growth stocks. That's why I partner with Masterworks.io. They're the only platform that lets you invest in physical, multi-million dollar paintings for a fraction of what billionaires pay to purchase them. This isn't some gimmick. Contemporary are almost tripled the S&P 500's total returns from 1995 all the way to 2020. Masterworks has a team of analysts that find paintings with the best risk-adjusted returns, which is something we're clearly not getting with Teladoc. Recently, Masterworks sold a painting by Albert Olin, returning almost 34% to investors after fees. So, I reached out to them to give you VIP access to their latest offerings, which also lets you skip their waitlist. I'll leave a link to that exclusive offer for you in the description below. And while I'm being super transparent, I don't actually make any more money for you signing up with Masterworks. I just think it's awesome that they're making fine art available to all investors instead of just the ultra-rich. Okay, let's dive back into Teladoc's earnings call, and specifically their 50% increase in marketing spend. The reason for this increased spend is simple. Teladoc is starting to compete with more single point solutions. So for example, BetterHelp, which is Teladoc's mental health solution, is competing more with companies focused only on providing online mental help. Livongo is competing with companies focused on only chronic care, and it's not doing as well as they expected when they acquired it. Hence, the big goodwill impairment charge we just talked about. That's how it all fits together. Teladoc's entire end-to-end -end ecosystem is competing with a lot more individual, targeted online products, and on this past earnings call, management admitted that that competition is tougher than they thought. As an investor who focuses on the science behind the stock, this is terrible news. Teladoc's moat is that they're an end-to-end -end online healthcare solution. So they're getting lots of data at every step of the patient journey, which means they can use it to make integrated care plans, cross-sell other services and products, offer bundles and discounts, and leverage their huge network in ways that smaller players can't. If they're losing to more focused solutions, that means their moat isn't really working. That's a very different tune than management was singing just two months ago when they touted the growth and momentum of BetterHelp. A huge part of Teladoc's guidance revisions downward are driven by BetterHelp's updated performance. I think Elon Musk really opened my eyes to the importance of management being invested in the company. One of the big problems with Twitter was that its board of directors simply weren't invested in the company. Like literally, they hardly own any shares. Well, it turns out that the same is true of Teladoc. Jason Gorovic owns a little over 900,000 shares of the company, or about 0.6%. Other than him, no one owns even half a percent of the company. Compare that to ARK Invest, who owns over 10% of Teladoc. I know it's not apples to apples, but it's hard to say you're aligned with shareholders when you don't have any meaningful skin in the game. Look, I'm not saying every company needs to be founder-owned and led, but just for reference, Larry Page and Sergey Brin still own around 3% of Google each. Mark Zuckerberg still owns over 10% of Meta Platforms, Jeff Bezos owns around 10% of Amazon, and Elon Musk owns over 20% of Tesla. See what I'm getting at? Alright, let's put everything together. Two years ago, Teladoc overpaid for Lavongo by somewhere between 40 and 75%, and it just caught up to their books. Separately, they increased their marketing spend by 50%, while lowering their guidance on revenue growth and the number of total visits they expect this year. This is a big shift from a quarter ago, and it really calls into question management's ability to execute. In my opinion, the fact that they're hardly invested in the company also calls into question their motivation to execute. 
But what's even worse than that, it really calls into question the science behind their stock, the actual moat. Forget the trope about Teladoc being Zoom for doctors. That's never been a smart thing to say about Teladoc. But if actually building an integrated healthcare ecosystem doesn't give you an edge when competing with single point solutions, why are you overpaying on mergers and acquisitions to build one? Okay, now that you have a clear picture of where Teladoc went wrong, let me show you just how much money I lost on this trade. First up, let's look at my main retirement account. I can't touch this money for another 30 plus years, so just keep that in mind. By cost basis, my top three positions in this account are ARK-K, Teladoc, and ARK-G. ARK-K is ARK Invest's flagship innovation fund, and Teladoc was a top three position in that fund. ARK-G is ARK Invest's genomics fund, and Teladoc is a top three position in that fund as well. As you can see, I have over $90,000 in those two funds and another $42,000 directly in Teladoc itself. But wait, there's more. Here's my Roth IRA, where I have another $23,000 in Teladoc, which is worth just $6,000 today. Teladoc's top was at around $300 per share, and I bought it at $118, and I'm still down 75% on this position. But wait, there's more. Teladoc was a top three position in the public portfolio that I run for this channel, or at least it was until it erased almost half of its value in a single day. But wait, I'm just kidding. There's no more. But I am showing you all of that for a reason. I have over a hundred grand in Teladoc and funds that hold a lot of it. So I really do feel your pain. Speaking of funds that hold it, let's talk about ARK Invest next. ARK Invest is the largest institutional shareholder of Teladoc. They own over 11% of the company's shares. Talk about conviction. ARK Invest has Teladoc in four of their six actively managed funds, and it's a pretty big position in every fund it's in. So even if you don't hold Teladoc stock directly, you're exposed to it if you hold ARK-K, ARK-G, ARK-W, or even ARK-F. In fact, if you combine the six funds that Kathy Wood actively manages, Teladoc was ARK Invest's second biggest position overall, only behind Tesla. I say was because its value just got cut in half. So after that big crash, it's in eighth place. But who knows what position it will end up in over the next week. But what I can tell you is that Kathy Wood just bought another 600,000 shares of Teladoc stock the day after this earnings call, so she's already started buying this dip. I've said it before, but I'll say it again here. Teladoc will be the stock that redefines ARK Invest. Nobody doubts their research when it comes to Tesla. They called it early and they called it correctly. But if Tesla stock made ARK famous, Teladoc stock will make them infamous, since it's already down 90% from its all-time highs a little over a year ago. 9-0. I'm really surprised to see that Kathy Wood would buy the dip on this news so quickly because the two things that ARK Invest really focuses on are the moat and the management. Do you have the right science to build a real market solution? And are you the right people to execute on that science? I'm not really saying that Teladoc can't turn the ship around, but I won't be buying this dip until I see some big changes or until somebody tells me what I'm missing. This was a pretty painful lesson for me, and I hope you see that I'm right there with you. And if you want to see what other lessons I learned by investing through this entire growth stock crash, check out this episode next. Either way, thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is probably not in Teladoc.